Good. Let me know if you can't hear me. I was, um, I was having a little joke with your colleague because uh, he gave me these beautiful roses. I said to him, what if I'm really boring? Don't you usually wait until after the performance to, uh, to hand over the, uh, the roses? But I'm really grateful to be here today at your university and thank you very much for your kind introduction as well. You know, uh, I've been talking a lot to universities in the United States. So far I've been to Stanford University and uh, to University of Washington in Seattle and to uh, Yale University to talk about some ideas uh, concerning statecraft in the 21st century. And I thought it would be really good to have an opportunity to begin to introduce these topics to an inter international audience and to talk to students beyond the United States. So this is my first, uh, my first uh, opportunity to do so. So I'm really glad to, to have this chance. It's also really unusual, I must say, uh, on Friday afternoon in American universities, usually the students have already gone away for the weekend. So I feel quite uh, honored that you have all turned up on a Friday afternoon. Thank you very, very much, and uh, look forward very much to our discussion. Uh, you know, I was uh, negotiating the New START Treaty with the Russian Federation in 2009 and 2010, but really, we look upon New START as really being just the beginning of nuclear arms reductions, leading us to uh, fewer and fewer nuclear arms and eventually to elimination of nuclear weapons. President Obama made it clear in his now famous Prague speech that the United States is committed to working toward the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. In order to pursue this goal, we know that we're going to have to think bigger and bolder. With this in mind, I've been challenging myself and my colleagues to think about how we use the knowledge of our past together with the new tools of the information age. When I look out to a crowd like yours and think about this issue, I realize that I don't need to convince you that the challenges of the 21st century are going to be much different than the challenges of the 20th century. I'm still figuring out how to use my iPad, but even I realize this. So today, I'll talk to you about our diplomatic toolbox, but also concentrate on uh, information technology as well. When it comes to pursuing next steps in nuclear reductions, we have a lot on our plate. And getting to zero is going to take time and heavy effort. There can be no shortcuts. The United States and Russian Federation still have a lot of work to do, as together we still control about 90% of the nuclear weapons in the world. And when we come to agreement on disarmament and non-proliferation measures, it takes hard, persistent work to first negotiate and then implement these agreements. Even more complicated, the lower you go in numbers and the smaller the units that you are trying to verify and monitor, like warheads, for example. Today, we monitor and verify <coughs> missiles, big intercontinental ballistic missiles that you can even see from outer space. But if you're trying to monitor and verify individual warheads, you have a much more challenging <coughs> problem on your hand. So the smaller the pieces you have to look at, the smaller the numbers, the harder it becomes both to negotiate and also to monitor compliance. It's clear that we're going to need every tool that we have available to us, and many that we have not even yet developed in order to implement President Obama's Prague agenda. That means the first thing we need is to take stock of the tools we already have in our diplomatic toolbox. First up, in the toolbox is regular legally binding arms control treaties produced through the negotiation process. This is the kind of process that led us to the New START Treaty. This, response, this process is responsible for the vast majority, in fact, of the international treaties and agreements in uh, the international arena and in the arms control and non-proliferation regime internationally. In the United States, we also have international agreements that uh, do not require the advice and consent of our Senate. Legally binding treaties do, but treaties that uh, are agreements that do not require advice and consent are called executive agreements. They too, however, are legally binding in our system. While these types of agreements are not used for reductions, they could be useful in securing agreement on confidence building measures, or other actions that may be important uh, to future treaty regimes. Another way to make changes in nuclear posture that was used in the past 
was through reciprocal actions that two countries uh, can take at the same time. The pros of such an approach include speed and flexibility. The con is that such arrangements may not be verifiable and can be reversed as a result of changes in policy. Progress on nuclear reductions is sometimes difficult due to a lack of trust between parties. A solution for this is mutual confidence building and transparency measures, or CBMs. These measures help establish lasting stability while at the same time taking into account each nation's security interests. Confidence building measures may include exchanging information about the size of a defense budget, giving notification of planned military activities, or even things as simple as in issuing invitations to national holidays or cultural and sporting events. So there's a wide range of measures that we consider to be in the realm of confidence building. The most challenging, of course, involve visits to uh, sensitive facilities. And uh, these are the types of things that we have frequently, frequently pursued. Another important way to build mutual confidence is to work together on tough problems. One of the great unsung success stories of the early post-Cold War years is how US and Russian scientists sometimes with scientists from other uh, countries among the newly independent states, work together to ensure the continued safety and security of fissile materials, weapons that can be used in nuclear weapons. And these projects took place throughout the 1990s and into the last decade, the 2000s. There are other cooperative efforts, like the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program as well, this was introduced in 1991 by Senators Sam Nunn and Richard Lugar. Uh, their legislation led to the establishment of the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program that helped to destroy a large amount of former Soviet weaponry, including nuclear weaponry, including hundreds of ballistic missiles and ballistic missile launchers. The CTR programs continue today and have expanded to tackle the threat posed by terrorist organizations or states seeking weapons of mass destruction expertise, materials, and equipment. So this uh, program, CTR, has expanded beyond being just a program for the former Soviet space and is now being used, for example, to help to destroy chemical weapons in Libya, uh, to help destroy chemical weapons in, in Albania, and to, uh, to really try to get a handle on difficult problems of this kind in countries and regions throughout the world. Now let me turn to the notion of 21st century statecraft or 21st century diplomacy. This is something that my boss, Secretary Hillary Clinton, has placed quite a bit of emphasis on and indeed she has spoken uh, quite publicly about 21st century statecraft. What does it mean? Diplomacy today is very, very different from the dawn of the nuclear age. More often diplomacy is happening in the open and at quicker speeds, making use of information technologies. <coughs> The world has changed, and we diplomats have to change with it. In my own experience, diplomacy has been changing before my very eyes. I was one of the junior diplomats associated with the START negotiations in 1990 and 1991. At that time, we were working on the first strategic arms reduction treaty with the Soviet Union. I remember how things were done back then. It was a paper process. Masses of paper had to be shuttled among delegation members and between us and the Soviet delegation. We were constantly burning out Xerox machines. Faxes flowed between Washington and Geneva. Remember the fax machine? It's kind of a dinosaur now. It's pretty much disappeared from the scene. In Geneva in 1990, if you had a secret and sensitive conversation that you had to have back with Washington, you had to sandwich yourself into a telephone booth that was steaming hot and shout down the line because that was the only sensitive telephone line that was available to call into Washington. So when we began the New START negotiations in April of 2009, we faced quite a different situation. The world had truly changed. The US and Russian delegations launched into the negotiations committed to keeping them businesslike, even when we did not agree, and believe me, there were many, many times when we did not agree with our Russian counterparts. This was a good decision, however, considering how easily either delegation could have broadcast negative comments that would have reached Moscow or Washington before we could even pick up the phone. Again, the speed of communication, the speed of information distribution. 
For me, the biggest change, however, was email. Instead of sending out large numbers of paper copies and waiting days or weeks for a response, we could get information around our delegation and back to Washington within seconds. <coughs> Both classified and unclassified materials could be sent, even most sensitive materials, decreasing necessary trips back to Washington and also therefore speeding up the negotiating process. After some discussion, we also agreed to exchange negotiating documents with the Russian team electronically, although on disks and not via email. Still, even CDs made a big difference to our after-hours communication. There was a famous story from the start negotiations back in the 1990s about how one night uh, we had some negotiating documents that we had to get to the Soviet delegation at that time. And if you're in a negotiation like this, you are working practically 24 hours a day. So at midnight one night, we had some negotiating documents we had to get to the Soviet delegation for urgent discussion the next morning. We went down to the Soviet mission, and the gate was closed, and everybody had left. And we could see on the other side of the gate was our negotiating counterpart waiting for our papers to come, but there was no way to get the gate open because the guards had all gone home for the night. So the American guy took the satchel and threw it over the fence, and his Soviet counterpart caught it and you know, took it in. And then they were ready for the negotiating session the next morning. But even a CD made a big difference, because we were, we were experiencing some of the same things during this negotiation in 2009 and 2010. But luckily, with a disc, all you have to do is pass it through the gate. You don't have to throw it, throw it over the fence. So uh, even in this way, I would have rather have used email with our Russian colleagues, but uh, even the disks made a difference to our communications. In my view, these new approaches to a formal negotiating process, especially the new digital means, the electronic means, were a big factor in the fast pace of our negotiations. They were exactly one year from start to finish, from April 24th of 2009 to April 24th of 2010 when we dotted the last I and crossed the last T on the New START Treaty and its associated protocols. That's a big change from the START negotiations, which they did have some delays because of political problems between the Soviet Union and the United States, but the START negotiations took in total about six years. So it was a big change, a big change from the past and one of the major factors, in my view, was the speed of electronic communication. So nowadays, I don't have to wait until the next time I travel to Geneva or Moscow to talk to my counterparts. I can send them an email. I can send them even a text message. And before too long, I hope to be able to go across the hall from my office and engage them on a video conference. That is coming. It's taking time, and it probably makes you laugh because you're quite acquainted with the video uh, the full range of video and uh, iPhone uh, potential out there. But uh, for the dipl diplomatic world, these are some major, major changes. They are akin, in my view, to the changes that emerged when the telegraph came in the 1860s, and suddenly diplomats had to cope with getting an instant cable from their capital telling them what to do, instead of being out by themselves in Africa or in North America or down in Latin America and being out on their own, suddenly they were tethered to their capital and communications were much more uh, quick. So business could be done more quickly as well. It's the kind of change we're seeing today with the advent of electronic media. Finally, let me turn to the role of these new information technologies in arms control monitoring mm -hmm. and verification. These astonishing advancements in communication technology over the past decades may not just be useful in the diplomatic processes, but also they may be able to aid in the verification of arms control treaties and agreements. Our new reality is a smaller, increasingly networked world where the average citizen connects to other citizens in cyberspace hundreds of times a day. They exchange and share ideas on a wide variety of topics. Why not put this vast problem-solving network to work? Or to put it another way, how can we use new media technologies, combining them with our experience in the arms control arena, 
to help us with our arms control monitoring and verification problems. Today, any event on the planet can be broadcast globally in mere seconds. That means it is harder to hide things. When it is harder to hide things, it is easier to be caught. The neighborhood gaze is a powerful tool, and it can help to make us sure that countries are following the rules of arms control treaties and agreements. Open source information technologies improve arms control verification in at least two ways. First, as a way to generate new information and to help us overall with monitoring and verification of treaties. Second, as analysis of information that is already out there. So let me give you a couple of examples. First, I wanted to talk about the so-called Red Balloon Challenge of the Defense uh, Advanced Research Projects Agency in our Defense Department. This was, uh, it's, it's actually an interesting project. I would, uh, if you're interested, I would uh, suggest that you Google it because it'll give you a lot more information than I can give you today. It's called the Red Balloon Challenge. It's an example of uh, generating new information. The challenge demonstrated the enormous potential of social networking to solve problems and also showed how incentives can motivate large populations to work toward a common goal. Essentially, DARPA sent, out, uh, sent up uh, a number of large red weather balloons around the United States and issued a challenge, international challenge, to see how quickly the balloons could be found. They were in random places around the United States. And it ended up, they thought it was going to take about a week to find all the balloons. It took about 48 hours. A team from MIT won by working with, uh, with teams all around our country and even some international participants as well. And so they were able to find all of these, uh, I believe they were 10 red balloons within a very short period of time. It was actually astonishing how fast it was done. DARPA did not predict that it would happen so quickly. So applying such ideas to arms control, a country could, for example, show that it is complying with the treaty by opening itself to a verification challenge. A, a technique such as this, I call it a uh, public verification challenge, might be especially valuable as we move to lower and lower numbers of nuclear weapons. Governments in that case will have an interest in proving that they are meeting their reduction obligations and may want to engage their publics in helping them make the case that they are not somehow hiding nuclear capacity uh, in the woods or in some uh, place off, off limits. It will then be necessary to work together to make sure that <coughs> nations cannot spoof or manipulate the verification challenges that they devise. That's a big problem, but one I'm sure that you and the next generation will be able to handle. This kind of citizen-run verification and monitoring project could add to the standard international safeguards or verification measures that are associated with the country's nuclear declarations and nuclear <coughs> obligations under treaties and agreements. <coughs> Once again, we have to bear in mind that there could be limitations based on the freedoms available to citizens in any individual country and issue to tackle in thinking through this problem. The information age is also creating a greater talent pool of individuals. People can reach a broader, diverse market for their products and services. They can develop web-based applications for e-book readers, cell phones, and touchpad communication devices. This crowdsourcing lets everyday people solve problems by getting innovative ideas out of their heads and into the marketplace. Open source technology of this kind, again, developed by any number of creative individuals, could be useful in the hands of inspectors. Smartphone and tablet <coughs> applications could be created for the express purpose of aiding in the verification and monitoring process for arms control treaties. For example, by having all safeguards and verification sensors in an inspected facility wirelessly connected to the inspector's iPad, he or she could note anomalies and flag specific items for closer inspections, as well as comparing readings in real time and interpreting them in context. Some of this kind of thing is already happening. For example, <clears throat> I know that uh, we have a transparency program under the so-called uh, highly enriched uranium purchase agreement, and inspectors who go to Russia are already able to compare data that they get in, uh, in uh, their readings of monitoring, uh, monitoring devices there 
against information that they have downloaded on their iPhones or iPads coming from, uh, from sites elsewhere in the United States. So already some of our inspectors are beginning to use some of these techniques. And by the way, also in other areas like uh, agricultural monitoring and so forth are these kinds of techniques used where you can compare data that is downloaded in real time against what you're seeing out in the field. So very important, very important challenge and interesting to think about how we develop the standards to use such, uh, such approaches. So um, one last application idea I'd like to mention and I think it could be very useful for inspectors in the future is to take sensor readings and feed them into 3D virtual models of a facility, again, that could be available on a laptop or even iPad, so an inspector could tailor ins an inspection in real time before he or she even steps inside a facility. As we think through new ways to use these electronic tools, we should be aware that there may be trouble ahead. We cannot assume that information will always be so readily available, and we see constraints being placed on the use of the internet every day in countries around the world. So that is definitely an issue to be concerned about and to, uh, to focus on. As nations and private entities continue to debate the line between privacy and security, it is possible to imagine that we are today living in a kind of golden age of open source information that will be harder to take advantage of in the future. In the end, the goal of using open source information technology and social network generated information should be to supplement our existing arms control verification and monitoring capabilities and we will need your help to think through how other means and methods might be developed to, to enhance this type of relationship between open source, readily available information technologies and what is done in a more formal verification and monitoring regime under a treaty. But I think it's a very interesting challenge, a very difficult problem in many ways, but very, very interesting and one that we should take advantage of. I'll tell you, I came to this during the course of the New START negotiations when I was asking my own inspectors who were working with me on the delegation, well, can't you take advantage of, of Google Earth? Uh, and they would say, well, actually we do take advantage of Google Earth before we go in to, uh, to Russia to uh, do an inspection of a facility, we check what's on Google Earth about that facility. We kind of get an idea of how it looks today, whether there's snow cover, whether there are particular new uh, changes that we need to be aware of, but we're not allowed to use Google Earth in the course of the inspection. The inspection has some very official procedures and that's what we have to use during the course of these uh, inspections. So it's my idea that we should begin to marry up what's available to the whole world in open source with what we use in very official settings like an uh, arms control verification or inspection process. So we're thinking about a lot of new concepts. They're challenging concepts, they're difficult concepts. As I said at the outset, this speech today is, uh, is about some new ideas and some new thinking. It's not official US policy by any means. It's an ideas speech, not a policy speech. But you're the first uh, set of university students outside of the United States who has heard these ideas. They've engendered some significant discussion and debate uh, in the United States, and I look forward to hearing what you think about them, hearing your questions. By the way, I'll be happy to answer your questions on a broader front. I'll do whatever I can. I may not have the answer of everything uh, to everything that you ask, but I will certainly do my best. So thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I look forward to our discussion. Thank you.